we're going through our series called Fearless Faith. We have 13 weeks of this. We're in our fifth week. Today we talk about somebody named Joshua. So I call this, um, it's, we're talking about Joshua. It's more than a quote. You'll understand that shortly. And the reason I say it's more than a quote is because in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, uh, verse 15, it's got that saying, but as for me and my house, we'll see it serve the Lord. Now, I don't know if any of you have this in your house. There's not, uh, it's a wonderful quote. And I know I, a few people have this quote. They have it in their doorpost in their house. And I'm going to talk about this today because I think it's, we need to make sure that it's not just a quote, but it does mean something to us. But we're going to start off in uh, Joshua chapter 1, but we're going to go through some verses as we go through the, um, not the whole book of Joshua, but part of the book of Joshua. Now, the, Joshua went into the promised land and conquered it. Remember, Moses couldn't go in, but Moses led them to the promised land, and Joshua went in and took over the promised land, became the land from the land of Canaanites. And there's basically 30 different armies they defeated. Now, here's the thing. The crucial lesson that I want us to learn today and understand is that faith and obedience is key to this Christian life. Faith and obedience to the, is key to anybody that wants to serve God. Everybody knows about faith, but it, right along with faith goes obedience. So let's try to remember that as we look at this here today. Now, let me just kind of go through briefly um, what we've went through so far. The first guy we talked about was Abraham. And Abraham is the one that started with faith. He left the Ur land Ur of the Chaldees and went to up there in Haran, then down to Canaan. And Genesis 15, 6 says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Remember that verse. Now, there's three times that verse is repeated in the New Testament. Romans chapter 4, verse 3, Galatians 3, 6, and James 2, 23. It says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So that has to have some meaning to it. Abraham was saved by faith in what God said he was going to send his Savior. Remember, he took Isaac and he was going to sacrifice Isaac, and God said he'll provide the lamb. And so Abraham started off with faith. You and I have to start off with faith too, don't we? Okay, the second one was Jacob. Jacob was all about becoming mature. Now, Jacob was kind of a conniving uh, deceiver. He was bad. He, he started off bad. But he grew up in his faith. He, at, toward, as he got older, Genesis 35, 7 says he had an altar called El Bethel, which is the house of God, and he finally matured. And so that second point, as you and I have faith, we must grow up in our faith. You know, we're, it says that a newborn baby drinks milk, and a new Christian is the same way. But as you get mature in your faith, you should eat meat, and you should get, grow up in your faith. So the third one we looked at was Joseph. Now, Joseph was a son of Jacob. He was uh, the second to the youngest. But Joseph grew up when Jacob had finally matured, so that was good, because Joseph grew up in a godly home. And remember, Joseph, the whole idea with him is handling adversity, Right. If you had your brothers throw you in a hole and sell you to the Egyptians, you'd think, I, I, these aren't very friend, friendly brethren. I can't wait till I get even with them, you know, when I get older. But Joseph, he went to Egypt, and Joseph understood he was in the will of God. Joseph knew that even though he was struggling and things were going on bad in his life, he even got thrown in jail, right? He's accused of uh, having a relationship with uh, uh, Potiphar's wife, and he got thrown in jail. He was obviously innocent, but he was in the will of God. And he says in Genesis 50, 20, he says, you meant evil for me, but God meant good. Okay, so he knew that even though the brothers meant evil, God had a plan in his life. So he was in the will of God. And it reminds me of that verse, Romans 8, 28, right? Romans 8, 28 says, and we all know things work together for good to them that love God and to them are called according to his purpose. So if you're called according to his purpose um, and, and you love God, Things are going to work out. Now, that does not mean you're going to have all this prosperity and everything, like the prosperity preachers tell you, that you're going to be rich, you're going to have material possessions, you're going to have the right relationships, the right job. No. No. Sometimes we are in this world and we struggle with things, don't we? We also go through things in our lives, and that's normal. So don't think that the Christian life is supposed to be all roses and flowers and, and sunshine. It's not. It rains on us as it rains on other people, and it sunshines on us the same way. So as a Christian growing up, we need to understand, first we start with faith, then we become mature, but we're going to have adversity. Satan's going to always attack you. You're going to go through things in life. It's just living in this cursed world, we're going to go through things. So then after Joseph, there was Moses. And what did Moses teach us? He taught us we have to make a commitment. Moses had all, this, all the excuses in the world. He had excuse after excuse after excuse. Finally, he come to his senses, and he said, God, I'm going to serve you. And he was like the greatest prophet in Israel's history. So Moses finally made the commitment. Exodus 3, verse 14 what does it say? The great I am. When Moses said, who should I say sent me? God says, say the great I am sent you. 
So as long as you and I realize that God is the great I am and he's on our side, we have nothing to worry about or be concerned about. So the idea with Moses was make that commitment. Now what we're going to talk about with Joshua is staying focused. Okay, you have that faith, you become mature, you handle adversity, you make the commitment, stay focused, stay on track. Don't live in fear, don't be afraid. My youngest son, Justin, when he was a kid, he had a, a little, was it like a banana bike or whatever bike, but he had a sticker on there that said no fear. And I think this no fear is, was a bike company of some kind, I don't know if anybody you remember, and it said no fear. And I, so I thought of that, but that's what Joshua is, says, no fear. He went in and conquered the land, he didn't have fear. Remember originally Joshua and Caleb went in the land and spied it out, and they're the ones that came back and said, hey, it's a land of milk and honey, we can take it. And now the other ten guys said, no, 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 no. They're, we're like grasshoppers, they're giants, and they were afraid. So, in Joshua 24, 15, it, as I read here, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a nice verse, but make sure that that's more than just a quote and, or a decoration in your house. You know these people that put these little fish on their bumpers, on their cars or the bumper stickers about Jesus or the cross or whatever, and then somebody cuts them off, and the next thing you know, they're, they're not acting like a Christian at all. So make sure if you have this stuff that you act like what you say you do as a Christian. So that quote, that's why I'm saying that. People put that up in their house, and it looks nice, but hey, how do you fulfill that quote? How do you go ahead and serve God, as that quote verse says? Now next week, we're going to talk about Gideon. Gideon struggled with fear. We're going to talk, Gideon basically, we're going to go back through all these first characteristics, first five that we talked about, and see that Gideon finally came to, uh, you know, grew up and got smart enough and God used him a lot. He was the most likely candidate. Don't you sometimes think in my life I'm the least likely candidate for God to use? I mean, here's me, I'm down here. How can God ever use me? He should use that guy. Well, you know what? God can use any of us, and we're going to learn that next week when we talk about Gideon. So, let's go ahead and get into Joshua here. When Moses left Egypt, Moses was 80 years old at that time. Joshua was somewhere around 20. Joshua went with him, and Moses was chosen to lead him to the Promised Land. Joshua took them in the Promised Land. So let's go ahead and look at Joshua chapter 1. And going into Promised Land, these people are not going to fall over and say, yeah, come on and take our land. There's going to be a battle, warfare. And this is a physical warfare. Obviously, behind physical warfare, there's a spiritual battle. Today you and I go through, through spiritual battles, don't we? Many times they represent physical battles with people or different ones, right? But behind all that, there's something spiritual going on. And Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, tells us to put on the whole armor of God. So go back and read them, verses 10 through 18, Ephesians chapter 6, and understand this, that most of the problems we have in this world is a spiritual battle. In fact, the problems right now we see with our government and with politics, there's something spiritual behind all this, there really is. And you have to understand that Satan's, Satan wants to come and rule this world, and he will for a short time during that seven-year tribulation. But then he's going to meet his end at the end, and God's going to come back and make things right. So we don't have to be discouraged in this world. We can be encouraged. But let's go ahead and look at Joshua chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 2. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Now, where did that name Israel come from? Well, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, right? So now they're going to call this the land of Israel. Here's the thing. The first five books of the Bible is what's called the Pentateuch of the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, number, uh, Deuteronomy. Now we get into the book of Joshua. And the next 12 books in the Bible are historical books. Joshua through Esther. So Joshua is the actual first historical book in the Bible that talks about some of the histories of the Israel Jewish people. But as you see here, Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. And he was buried in the land of Moab, according to Deuteronomy 34. And it says there's actually a verse in Jude chapter 1, verse 9, that it says... Michael the archangel and Satan contended for the body of Moses. I'm not going to cover that, but it's kind of an interesting verse that what's going on here. They didn't, they, Moses was buried, but nobody knew where he was buried. And that's what the Bible says. Now what happened to Moses? Well, he lost his temper, and it says he would not go into the promised land according to Deuteronomy 32, verse 51 and 52. But in Numbers 20, the first 29 verses there, first 30 verses, Moses lost his temper and struck the rock. He didn't do what God said. He disobeyed him. And so God says, you're not going to disobey me in this. You're not going to go into promised land. So Moses died at the age of 120. He was buried there. And then his minister, minister means servant or protege, 
uh, Moses mentored Joshua, and Joshua now has taken over. And so Joshua is going to lead them into the promised land. And we see that Joshua and Caleb, if you go back and look at the story when Moses originally sent them, his 12 spies out, Joshua and Caleb were the ones that came back and said, it's go time. The other guy said, no, it's no time. We're not going. And they were afraid. So now they had to wander around in the wilderness for 40 more years. So that was what happened there. Let's go ahead now and look at uh, this next here verse I got on the screen. We won't have to look this up. But Deuteronomy 34, verse 5 through 9, it says, Moses, a servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he was buried, him in a valley, in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Yeah, it seems strange. They buried him, but I just nobody know. I don't know. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural face abated. In other words, no, Moses was 120 years old, and he still had good eyes. I sit, and he looked good. I mean, don't you wish that could be us too? <laughs> As we get older, we, you struggle with things and we, get, we lose our eyesight, we lose our thinking, and physically we can't do what we used to do. But it says that Moses was still strong. And then it says, And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days, so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hand upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Okay, so we see this story about what happened with Moses and Joshua took over. I don't have verse 10 up here, Josh, uh, Deuteronomy 34, verse 10, but let me read you verse 10. Verse 10 says this, And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. So Moses was like the greatest prophet in Israel's time. He struggled, he had some problems, he did some things wrong, but he's very, very much revered by the Jewish people, even to this day. And... It says that he knew the Lord face to face. Now, there's a verse in the Bible that says anybody that looks on the face of God is going to die. Now, Moses, that does not mean he looked on the face of God. Now, when we get to heaven, we're going to be able to look on the face of God and see the glory of God. There was kind of a picture of that at the transfiguration when Jesus transfigured himself. But, you know, God now has to appear to mankind in a burning bush, in an angel of the Lord, a theophany, and in different ways. Because if you look at the face of God, you're going to die. But that's not what verse 10 of Josh, Deuteronomy 34 means. The Lord knew him face to face. That actual word knew is the Hebrew word yada. Now, you know what yada is, right? Yeah, from Seinfeld. So, yeah, yada, 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 <laughs> right? Or from Charlie Brown. What did Charlie Brown say? Wah, 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 the teacher, or as we would say, blah, 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 blah. So that's what it means. Moses knew the Lord face to face. He talked to him face to face, is what that's saying, in the burning bush. So yada, 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 yada. Okay, so Deuteronomy 18, 15. This is what Moses said is going to happen in the future. You won't have to turn there. I'll just read this verse. Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst. From your brethren, him you will hear. So Moses is talking about a future prophet, and that was Jesus Christ in Deuteronomy 18.15. Remember when Jesus Christ went to um, the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist, and John the Baptist says, I can't even untie your shoes, I'm not worthy. Well, Moses was talking about someday there's going to be a prophet, you know, like 1,500 years or so before Jesus came. And we sat here and look and say, what's going on? It's been 2,000 years since Jesus, where is he? Well, you know what? God's timing is different than our timing. He is coming back. I guarantee you. And it could be soon. It could be close. We need to make sure we have our hearts right with God. So, Let's go ahead and look at verse 7 of Joshua chapter 1. And verse 7 says this, Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Then in verse 9, Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. So, them are some encouraging words from, that God told Joshua. If you see here, Stay focused. So the whole key about Joshua, he, he had faith. He wasn't fear. He had to stay focused. He stayed focused on what it was he had to do. And if you read through these verses, uh, verse 8 and so on, it says, read God's word, study God's word, think about God's word, obey God's word. 
God's word is the key to our life. We must know God's word. It has more power than you imagined in your life, and it can. But then the third bullet point, put God first and you will be blessed. You will be blessed according to God's will. Don't be afraid. Live with courage. Don't get discouraged. No, that is a rough one. Don't get discouraged. Are you kidding me? I get discouraged quite often. Do you, do you get discouraged ever? I mean, we all get discouraged at times, right? It's rough. It's sometimes things happen. And yet, he says, don't get discouraged. You Jewish people, we're facing these people, and we're going to get discouraged. Don't let it happen to you. Now, the thing is, when you get discouraged, get up again, wipe yourself off, and move on. And just get a good night's sleep and rest and so on. Because we all tend to get discouraged. But let's go ahead and look at verse uh, 5 and 6 of chapter 3 as we move on here. Chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, starting with verse 5. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify or consecrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant, and went before the people. So verse 15. Verse 15 through 17. And as they bare, or carried, the Ark were come unto Jordan, that's the Jordan River, and the feet of the priests that bare the Ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest. So they had to cross the Jordan. And then verse 16, The waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam, that is beside Zaratan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, which is the dead sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. Now that verse in the King James is hard to understand, so I'll explain it to you in just a second. And in verse 17, And the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until the people were passed clean over the Jordan, or completely over the Jordan. So here's the thing. He's saying, get your hearts right before God because we're going to battle. And that's true for any of us, right? If your heart's not right before God, you're going to struggle. And they are going to battle. Be prepared to see God work is what he said there. They carried the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant had three things inside of it. Y'all remember what was inside of it? They had a little pot full of uh, the manna, uh, the wafers that they ate off the ground. They kept that in the Ark. Uh, Aaron's rod that he used, which budded, they kept that in the Ark, and they kept the Ten Commandments in there. This Ark kind of represent, represented the presence of God. They carried it with them. So people look at the Ark and say, God is with us. Now, you and I, when we look at a cross, what do we think of? We think of Jesus died on that cross for us. It always reminds us. And that's something, when you have communion service and you have the grape juice and the bread or the wafer, you remember that God shed his blood for us. He broke his body for us on the cross. So they use this Ark of the Covenant as a type of a symbol of, hey, God is with us and carry this Ark with you. So now in verse 16, this is an ver interesting verse. It's a little hard to understand, but what that is saying there, basically the people of the Canaanites were lived in this city called Jericho. Now Jericho was somewhere around 10 acres of land. It had big high walls all around it, and it was up on a hill. It was mounted up on a tell. So these people that lived in Jericho, they say that after they looked at, studied this city from the archaeological diggings, they found out that like 1,200 people could live in the city, but they believed like another three to 4,000 lived outside the city. But now that they knew that these Israelites were coming there, they got f afraid, and they went inside that city and boarded up the walls and the doors, and all 5,000 people went in the city. And I'll cover a little bit what they found in there when they did the archaeologist digs in there later on. But they went in the city, and up in the city, they could look down and they could see the Jordan River from where they were. This is in southern Israel, down by the Dead Sea. The Jordan River flowed from the Sea of Galilee down through Israel down to the Dead Sea, okay? So they came to the, these guys, the priests and the Israelites, came to the Jordan River, and they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. They said they put the, their toes in the water. Now, the water was real deep at this time of year because this was in the fall. This was at the harvest, and there was a lot of rain, and it was deep, and it was wide. But what happened, what it said was the water uh, boarded up, walled like this, and then all the way from there to the Dead Sea, it was just land. And they crossed over it kind of just like they did with the Red Sea, as we talked about last week. So that's what happened. Now these people in Jericho were standing up there looking at this saying, hmm, I don't think I want to fight with this God. I don't think I want to be there, be here. And so they were living, they were shaken, they were in fear. Now there's one person that lived in the city of Jericho um, who's talked about in the Bible in the New Testament. Anybody know who that is? Right? Female? Rahab. Rahab, exactly. Rahab lived there. 
And so we're going to talk about Rahab here in just a minute. But prepare to see God's work. They carried the Ark of the Covenant, and they could see the waters part, so they were in fear. Now, I, I looked in verse 16 here, and it says the city of Ab Adam, that is by Zeraton. And I think, the city of Adam? I've never heard of a city of Adam before. And this is the only place that the city of Adam and Zeraton are in the Bible mentioned. And I'm thinking, is this commemorative of Adam when Adam was the first man and they named the city after him? I don't know. Who knows? That's a good guess, right? <laughs> I don't know. But it's called the city of Adam here down near the Dead Sea and the city of Zeraton. These both these cities are not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible, so I don't know much about them. But now in Iraq is where this all started when God, you know, came to this world. He created Ark of the, uh, the Garden of Eden the Tower of Babel, which is Babylon, a city in Iraq, which is a rebuilding right now. But that was all happened in Iraq. This was a few hundred miles away. So why this was named the city of Adam, I don't know. It, it could be just some kid named Adam, you know, grew up and he was famous. I don't know. Or it could be named after Adam of the first man created. But we'll find out when we get to heaven. It's a good question. I'm not sure we're going to worry about that too much. It has nothing to do with the message. It has nothing to do with the context. But I just thought that was interesting when I saw that. Okay. Let's look at our next slide here. And we'll see Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 and 15. If you'd flip over there or on your phones to verse 13 of Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. And it, said, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho. Remember, Jericho was just on the other side of the Jordan. They were boarded up. When Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him or across from him, with his sword drawn in his hand. Hey, I think I'd be a little bit nervous. Some guy draws a sword on me. And Joshua went up to him, went up to him. What is he, nuts? I mean, that's no fear. He, he should have that sticker for the bike put on him. No fear. He went up to him with his sword drawn. Joshua went up to him and said unto him, Are you for us, or are you one of our enemies? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it looked like there might be a conflict here. And verse 14, and he said, No. But as captain of the house, host of the Lord, am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. And Joshua did so. Remember back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, when Moses went to the, the burning bush and they said, Take off your shoes? And this is the same thing happening here. Now, we don't have to take our shoes off in church, do we? I mean, this, a church is not the building. The church is you and I, right? Now, in Christianity. But he had to take his shoes off. He, he's in the presence of God. Now, how do I know this was a theophany or this was God here? Well, because he did not say, don't worship me. In the book of Daniel, and actually in the book of Revelation, it talks about somebody meeting an angel and falling down to this angel and worshiping them. And it told Daniel, get up. I'm just an angel, just like you, a servant of God. And in the book of Revelation, when John fell down before an angel, the angel said, get up, I'm just like you, I'm an angel. But here when, when uh, Joshua fell down, it didn't say that. This was not a regular angel. This is what was called a theophany or a Christophany. This was Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate Christ, before he became a baby. He used to appear at times in the Old Testament. And I, I think that's fascinating here. So they, the city here was secure down and he says, where you stand, this is a holy ground, sacred ground. So now verse 1 through 5 of chapter 6. So verse 1 of chapter 6 of the book of Joshua, it says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because the children of Israel, and none went out and none came in. They had their doors locked up solid. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given unto thee thine Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass or surround the city, you shall march around the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city, thus shall do thou for six days. I'm thinking, what does that make any sense, right? Sometimes, do you ever say, God, why do you want me to do this, or what's going on? It doesn't make sense. This didn't make sense, but they obeyed and they did it. God, God knows more, a little more than you and I about things that he says for us to do. So obey him. And that's what they did here. And then verse 4, And the seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and Seventh day, ye shall circle the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. Then verse 5. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up, notice ascend up, every man straight before him. Now in verse 20. I'll give you a few seconds to look at verse 20 of chapter 6. And in verse 20 it says, 
So the people shouted out when the priest blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted out with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. A miracle. Now, some people say, oh, that must be just an earthquake that happened just at the right time. Well, yeah, it was an earthquake. It happened at the right time. God made it happen. So here's the thing. The city of Jericho was secure. It was locked up. When these stones fell down, they fell straight down, and it said that the Hebrews went up into the city. It was on a hill, remember? The Bible's always accurate. They went up into the city, and they took the city. They burnt it. They took all the gold and the silver to put in the house of the Lord. Uh, everything else they burnt up. Now, why wouldn't they have taken the food? God said not to, but they just took the silver and gold. And so they circled it for six days. On the seventh day, they went around seven times. Now, that number seven is interesting, isn't it? We talk about that once in a while. Did you know that the number seven means number of completeness? When Jesus was on the cross, he had seven last sayings. The last thing he said, it was finished. It is finished. Now, back in the Old Testament, the number seven is used quite a bit, but especially in the book of Genesis, like 61 times. In fact, in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the number seven is used 251 times. That's a lot. Remember, God created the world on the seventh day he rested? Do you know what? In the New Testament, the book of... The number seven is used 76 times. Did you know in the book of Revelation, it's 36 times? Isn't that amazing? It's the number of completeness. And the book of Revelation completes all things, finishes all things. And I, I thought, found that fascinating. The only other book in the New Testament that has anything close is Matthew, which has the number seven mentioned 10 times. But the book of Revelation has the number seven mentioned 36 times. And that's the book of completeness. Now, isn't it funny that the bookends of the Bible, Genesis and Revelation, are the two books that most people don't believe? Because... The book of Genesis talks about us being created, and yet people believe in evolution. Uh, even there's some many pastors that believe in evolution. In fact, they say only 37% of pastors that they did a poll on just recently truly believe in the Bible. And that's, that's, it. that's interesting, isn't it? But they don't, people don't believe in the book of Revelation. Most churches, you'll never hear the book of Revelation mentioned or talked about. Yet it's, 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 the, it's the accumulation of the whole Bible. It's the end of the Bible, and that's fascinating. We need to hear about it. So they went around it. The walls fell down. Um, as we see here in verse 20, interestingly, in the 1950s, there was an archaeologist from Great Britain named Catherine Ken Kenyon. I don't know if any of you have ever, ever heard of her. She took a team to Israel, and they went to this place where the Jericho was, and they studied it, and they found that these rocks fell straight down, and it was interesting. They also found that everything was burnt up in there, like I said, that, like they told Joshua to do. So that was fascinating. That actually happened the way they said it would. Now, archaeologists sent since then have gone there and confirmed all this. One thing's interesting. Remember Rahab? And we're talking about Rahab in a few minutes. She lived in a house there. She was a harlot. Remember when they went in there and she, she hid them in her house? And she showed that she had faith in God. She demonstrated her faith by actually doing that, keeping them safe in her house. And how did they identify her house? They dropped a red rope out her window, right? And that red rope, when the, when the Israelites went there, okay, this is the house we're not to go in and kill these people. We're to stay away from them. But here's what's interesting. Archaeologists found that the whole walls fell down around this whole city except for this one little place on the north end of the city, and it, this house and this walls didn't fall down or collapse. Now, now, you can't prove that that was Rahab's house. I don't think she says Rahab's house in the doorway or the house of Rahab, but I would make a big guess that that was, that that was the house that they lived in that didn't collapse during this, this um, simulated or earthquake that God created to happen here. So I thought that was extremely interesting. So let's go ahead and look at Joshua 6.22, and we'll talk a little bit more about Rahab. So Joshua 6, verse 22, and I'm going to read all the way through verse 25. I'm going to read verse 24 also. But Joshua 6.22, But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, and bring out thence the woman, and all that she hath, as she swore unto her. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren, brought out all her relatives and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron they put into the treasure of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab, the harlot alive, and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelt in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers with Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now, how important is, is Rahab? Isn't it funny that in the book of Matthew, Rahab's in the genealogy of Jesus? I mean, doesn't that show God's grace? I mean, that's amazing. 
but she was saved here physically, right? Everybody agrees with like that, right? Joshua saved her physically. How was she saved um, for eternal life for heaven? Spiritually, she was saved by what she believed. Just like in Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto righteousness. Rahab understand, stood who the God of the, the Hebrews were and trusted in him that he would send a Savior, Messiah. She must have knew in this to some extent. And then back in Joshua chapter 2, it talks about that red rope that they dropped down. That red rope, I believe, represents the blood of Christ. Remember back in Egypt when they took the blood from the lamb and they put it on the doorpost? And the angel of death went past there and didn't kill the firstborn of the, of the Hebrews? Same idea. Same idea. So, that red represents the blood of Christ. Now, it talks about Rahab in Hebrews chapter 11. And it also talks about her in James chapter 2. Rahab was justified before God when she um, believed God. She was justified before man when she went ahead and protected them in her house. So in James 2.23, it says, And Abraham believed God and counted it unto him for righteousness. That's the same way that Rahab got saved, the same way. Trusted God, believed on him. So we won't go into that too deep, but let's go ahead and continue on here. In Joshua 21, verse 43 and 45, I have it on the screen here. It says, the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he promised to give to their fathers, that's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and so on, possessed it and lived there, and failed not anything of any good thing which the Lord spoke unto the house of Israel, all came to pass. Now listen to this. This is the sweet, sweet blessings of faith and obedience with Joshua. And then look at this next one. Pay attention to this, this here. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Be real, sincere, be real. Truth, no doctrine, know the Bible. Do you know that people have a fear of doctrine? You say doctrine, they say, they get, oh, I'm not going to go to a church that teaches doctrine. But you know what doctrine is? The Greek word in the New Testament is didaskaleia, and didaskaleia just means teaching. What are you saying? I'm just going to go to a church that has no teaching? How are you going to learn anything? When you pay for your son or daughter to go to college and they're going to be a mathematician, if they don't learn how to add or calculus or uh, geometry or anything, trigonometry, you can say, what worth is this school? If they go to be a history teacher and they don't learn history. If they go to school to be a mechanic and they don't have the first, day, first thing about changing tires or working on your carburetor, you're going to wonder, well, what is a school? Well, the truth is, the Bible is the same way. You, it doesn't do you any good if you don't really learn what the Bible says. So doctrine or teaching is extremely important. You have to understand that. So it says there, serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood. That was before Noah. They had plenty of idols that they worshipped. You and I can have idols in our life too. We don't have to talk about that. But if you have anything that interferes with your service to God, that is an idol. And then it says, and in Egypt, and serve you the Lord. Now, in Egypt, they had tons of idols. They had all these gods they worship. And then it goes on to say, and if it seems evil unto you. Now, that's a kind of a funny word in the King James. It kind of seems evil unto you. In the New American Standard Bible it says disagreeable. In the New International Version it says undesirable. So what that's saying, what Joshua is saying here, if anything seems undesirable to you or disagreeable to you or you think this is not a smart thing to do, he goes on to say, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell in right now. As for me and my house will serve the Lord. So Joshua is saying, hey, you guys make a decision who you're going to serve. If you think this is dumb or ridiculous that I'm asking you this, hey, it's not dumb, it's not stupid. Serve God. As far as, far as me and my fowls, we are going to serve the Lord. So that's what he's saying. And then at the end it says, And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders, and outlived Joshua, and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. This is a wonderful way for the book of Joshua to end, that they're serving the Lord. Now when we get into Judges next week, you'd see at the end of the Judges that it says, every man did evil in their own ways, in their own eyes. So things get, went, went downhill pretty fast after Joshua. So here's the thing. Now I don't know if any of you have a plaque like this in your house. But like I mentioned earlier, if you have that plaque in your house or anything that says, you know, I'm a Christian, Make sure that you're living up to the, what that means, okay? It doesn't do you any good if you just put that plaque in your house. It doesn't do any good if you have a Bible sitting on your coffee table if you're never reading it, does it? And that's the truth. We have to make sure that if we're going to do this stuff, make sure we follow it. So I want to briefly go back real quick about Moses when he first said to go into the promised land. So we'll look at that here real quick. Because this is interesting. This is a point I want to get across here. Numbers chapter 13 on the screen. I'm going to read these verses. Verse 1, it says, this is back when Moses was alive. And he originally he said, we're going to go into the promised land. Moses, the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give it unto the children of Israel, every tribe. 
their father shall send a man, every one a ruler among them. So Moses originally had said, we're going to send out 12 spies, one from each tribe. Okay? Now, I don't have all the tribes listed here. I've only got in verse 6 the tribe of Judah, which was Caleb. And then verse 8, the tribe of Ephraim, which is Oshia, the son of Nun. So Joshua and Caleb were the two that said go. Then verse 16. This is the point I want to make. These are the names of the men which Moses sent out to spy the land. And Moses called Ashia, the son of Nun, Joshua. He changed his name. He changed his name to Joshua. And so that's interesting. So here, look at this. Oshia in Hebrew means salvation. He changed his name to Joshua means Jehovah's salvation. Do you know in the Greek language what the name Joshua is? It's Jesus. In the New Testament, Jesus and Joshua are the same name. One's Hebrew, one's Greek. They both mean Jehovah's salvation. Isn't that interesting? That's fascinating. I think it's you know, bringing more detail together about this, making it more specific. And then here in 1 John 3.23, and this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Isn't that interesting? God wants us to believe on Jesus Christ as Savior. Joshua was kind of a type of Jesus back in the Old Testament, and he went and conquered the land. Jesus came here and he conquered the land in the sense of sin, and he spiritually died on the cross for you and I for all our sin. Now, I've got a verse here that I'm going to quote to you. It's interesting. And that's Hebrews 7.25. A lot of people will say Hebrews chapter 3 or Hebrews chapter, chapter 6 is you can lose your salvation. No, they're taking the verses out of context. They're not believing what they say. Hebrews 7.25. Let me read this to you. It says, therefore. Whenever you see the word therefore, you say, okay, forget this stuff. Therefore. Hebrews 7.25 says, therefore, he, Jesus, is also able to save us to the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Did you know that Jesus Christ is in heaven and he intercedes for us? When he died on the cross, he paid for all our sin, past, present, future. And hey, don't go saying that I can lose my salvation because you can't. Christ paid for your sins, all your sins. And he's now saved you to the uttermost. How far is the uttermost, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a long ways. I mean, it never ends. In fact, there's a verse in Micah 7:19. It says, he threw your sins in the bottom of the depths of the sea. That's uh, Micah 7:19. God's point he's trying to get across is that when Christ died on the cross, he paid for your sins, past, present, and future. If he paid for all your sins, what sins do you have to pay for? You can't. They're all paid for. That's fascinating. There's another verse in Psalms. I can't remember the exact verse, but it says your sins are separated as far as the east is from the west. If you go east and you go west, how far are your sins separated? Forever. God paid it all. Jesus paid it all. So I thought that was fascinating. Now, we all know what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 up in this um, banner says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We can't lift our little fingers to save ourselves. All we can do is place our faith in Christ, and he gives you eternal life because you've trusted him. He saved us. He washed away our blood on the cross at Calvary. Revelation 1, 5 says, To him, Jesus, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And that's a myth. An amazing thing, isn't it? He gives us eternal life. You take his word for what he says, and we all know what John 3.16 says, which is up in this banner, For God so loved the world that you and I, that whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you have everlasting life, what do you have? You have everlasting life. You don't have temporary probation. He gives it to you forever. If it, if it wasn't everlasting life, you better change the name on it and call it something different. Once you place your faith in Jesus Christ as personal Savior, as Abraham did, as Joshua did, and even Rahab did. You have eternal life forever. That's the most wonderful thing in the whole world. Can you imagine? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer. Then we'll do our communion service real quick. And then we'll have our final hymn, Rock of Ages. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you did for us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for everything you did. And thank you for the story of Joshua, how he was faithful and that he obeyed you and he went in and conquered the land. And he allowed you to work in with the nation to conquer it. And it was not in their own strength, but it was in the strength of what God did. And we're going to see the same thing next week when we talk about Gideon. So help us now as we participate in this communion service just to remember your broken body and your shed blood on the cross of Calvary. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.